Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Grant, if we haven't met before, and we are on the third week of First Fruits. We've just been talking about, honestly, our finances. One of the reasons we do this is because we are, as people, kind of corrupt. I had a reminder of that yesterday. Um, we did this cute little thing where we knew a lot of people had lost power, and we knew they needed internet, and maybe, so we just decided to be nice, and we posted this thing on our social media. and said, hey, go get a coffee at Starbucks on us, so we put a little barcode on there. How many, how many people saw that? You guys see that out there? Yeah, some four of you follow us on social. So uh, anyway, we posted that. And within the first hour, somebody in Stockton, California had bought $60 worth of like mugs and stuff from Starbucks. And uh, so I just wanted to say like, if you're in Stockton, California, listening to that, enjoy, enjoy the mug, you know, and I hope every time you drink out of it, you think of Jesus is watching you. But <laughs> but that's why we can't have nice things. Okay. And, and we all have this like attachment when it comes uh, to money. The reason we think it's important to talk about this is because there's this intersection of two very important things happening. The first thing is we're on this, we're on this mission. If you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, you may not even remember this, but you're on a mission 24 seven, all the time, seven days a week, you're on this mission from God. Now, and there's also this intersection of our life where there's also this relationship that we all have when it comes to money, when it comes to our finances. And it's at this intersection that we think it's really important to talk about um, giving at the church. And so today what I wanna do really quickly is I wanna remind us of what that mission is. In Romans chapter 10, it's just a very simple way he describes our mission. He says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. At the very nucleus of the church, everything that we do is hoping to connect people with their heavenly father so that they can cry out to him, so they can call out to him, so they can seek God for their solutions and they can be restored to the relationship with God that they were intended to have and they were intended to be. Now, that's our mission at, a very, at our very core. But I want you to hear what Paul says is our role. And when I say our, I mean anybody who believes in Jesus. This is our role in accomplishing that or, or in connecting people in this relationship with God. Listen to what he says. He says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one they have not heard? And can, how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Now, I don't necessarily even agree with this, but this is how God's chosen to do it. It seems like there would be better ways, but this is how God has chosen to do it. He's made people finding a restored relationship with God dependent on those who are willing to preach to people. Sometimes preaching has a negative connotation, you know, it's just like, well, quit preaching at me, or it's like we're trying to change morality. That's not what he means by here by preaching. He's talking about this word. The word means to herald or to proclaim the message. He's talking, about, he's talking about communicating to people that we are all lost and broken. We have sin in our life that has separated us from God and that's actually what's broken with the world. It's what we call the gospel. But when we put our faith in Jesus, when we understand that God sent his only son to this earth to die so that we could be washed of our sin, so that we could be made whole, so that he could give us what they call a, a deposit of the Holy Spirit, a deposit, a little taste of what future glory is going to look like, what happens after we are him, with him forever in paradise forever. He gave his life so that we could put our, simply put our faith in him and be restored to our heavenly father. That's what he means by preaching. And yes, that's what happens on a stage and that's what we do in our student auditoriums on a stage and that's what we do with our kids' uh, ministry, but it's, it's also something hopefully every person who believes in Jesus does. When we sit down with coffee and we tell people that message, we are proclaiming, we are heralding the message. So our mission is to do this and all of us are involved in that. And the next verse he says, and how can anyone preach Unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So just a reminder, that's the mission we're on. I'll make the case that it is, it is the only mission on earth that actually matters because it's the only thing that addresses people's eternity. It, it comes back to the reason that we were created as people is to, to unite people back to their heavenly father and their creator. 
So that's the mission uh, we're on, and everything we do is about that mission. Now, on the other hand, each of us have this own, our own little walk, our own little journey that we're on as people when it comes to our relationship with money. And Jesus describes that relationship that we have in Matthew chapter six. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus addresses the fact that, that there's this tension inside of us that we have a, a relationship. All of us have a, a toxic relationship with money that takes God's place in our heart. And honestly, when it comes to money, one of the reasons we don't like talking about it is probably because there's been corruption in the church. There's people that have misused funds and done some really dumb stuff. I think that's one of the reasons we don't like to talk about it. And you should definitely investigate and try to understand where your money goes towards. Don't misunderstand me. But I think the reason that we actually don't like to talk about it is because I think that if you're like me, you have this very private very in the dark relationship with money and you begin to put your hope in your savings accounts and how much money you have in your checking account. You begin to put your hope in the vacations you can go on, the houses you can live in. You begin to seek happiness with the cars you can drive and the clothes you can wear. And so we have this very private, very don't wanna talk about it with anything, anybody relationship with money and I become so obsessed with it sometimes that it becomes my Process. <laughs> and then when somebody like me gets up on a stage and starts talking about money and, and they're like, hey, we're gonna talk about money today, you're like, no, you can't have it. It's, it's mine, you fat, stupid preacher. Like that's, I think that's really the reason we don't like to talk about it because we don't, we don't wanna pry it out of our hands. And I wanna just guarantee you today, that's not my objective. I'm not trying to pry anybody out of anything. Now, Today, I wanna to focus on this. I wanna talk about where does money come from? Psalm 24 reminds us of this. The, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Like everything comes from God. The only thing that you have in your possession are what you have been allowed to have. Now, it depends what kind of frame of mind you come from, but we have a tendency to think that money comes from other places. If you're, if you're a little bit more conservative, politically leaning, you think that money comes from hard work and being smart. If you're liberal, a little bit more liberal politically, you think that money comes from privilege. And I just wanna tell you that you're both wrong. Money comes from God. Everything is God's and the only thing that we possess is not because of our own hard work and our own determination. It's because God has decided that this is yours. Uh, my son, uh, one time we were at the cousin's house and there's, they have four kids, we have four kids and that makes 12 of us and we were all hanging out and they were doing a taco bar at their house and uh, they had all the uh, toppings laid out. My son was the first in line. He was like nine at the time. Uh, and he walked up to the cheese bowl. Now, my son doesn't like anything that resembles like health food at all. So the only thing that interested him were the cheese and the tortillas. That's it. That's all that interested him. So he goes up there and he lays out a couple tortillas and then he takes the entire bowl of shredded cheddar and he just scoops the entire thing onto his plate and he starts to walk away. He's gonna melt that all down and turn that into a massive quesadilla. Well, the, the rest of us, the other 11 people in line all immediately reacted and they're like, hey, what are you doing? And we all yelled like, that's not all for you. And so it was a proud moment where I had to turn to my son and be like, scoop it back on there. This is, so he scooped it back into the bowl. And I think that's what God would tell us. Like, listen, everything is from me. Everything you have is from me. Everything that you're allowed to possess is from me. And guess what? that's not all for you. And you're giving credit to yourself because you're hard work, because you're smart. You're, you're giving credit to yourself. And he says, no, that's not all for you. That's not why I gave it to you. We're just reminded today that God has given it to us and allowed us to possess it because we are stewards of what he has given us. And we always think to ourselves, 
Well, I mean, I'd love to be generous, but I just, I just don't have enough. And if I had a little bit more, then I could be more generous. We, uh, we looked up the, the IRS and what they say about that. And this comes to philanthropy. It comes to anything that's a, that's a cause, that's generosity of any kind, not just the church. But what you find is that people that make under 25K, they, they give 12%, the biggest percentage givers of all people's income. You make 25, it's probably hard to read. 25 to 50, you, get, you give 6.8%. 50 to 75, and on and on it goes. And the more you make, the actually the less percentage you get, probably because you're probably more obsessed with it. Until you get all the way over to here, which then you're right, if you're making over $2 million or more a year, you've finally arrived. So in some ways, you're right. If I just had enough, if I could just make $2 million a year, then I would be super generous. The point is, we, we don't do that. We don't give more the more we make. Actually, we have a tendency to get more obsessed with it. And so why it's important, again, is because this mission that we're on and this, this relationship with money that we have, that it comes together and it's worth talking about and it's worth speaking out loud. So today I wanna tell you a very simple story. It's a very simple parable. Um, it's, it's Jesus. Jesus actually talked more about money uh, than anybody else in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus has this moment where he recognizes something, and by doing this, I think we get to learn a lot about the heart and nature of God, and I think if we pay attention, we can find ourselves in the story. In Mark chapter 6, or 12, it says that Jesus sat down op- opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. I just want you to imagine the scene. There is this this metal box. We think that they actually used a metal box on purpose because it increased their offering numbers because here's why. All they had was coin. They didn't have cash. They didn't have the the app you could pay through, right? They had this box and you would walk into a very public space in the temple and you would bring your sack of coins and when you dropped it in there, the more money you threw in, the louder the splash it would make. So Jesus is sitting there with his disciples and he's watching people give money and there's people coming up giving out of the excess of their wealth. They take and they, they drop it in the bucket and it makes a sound. It goes, Psh! It actually says it right there that they threw in large amounts, you know? If you really wanted people to know, you'd stand back five feet and be like, here we go, everybody. Psh! Make that sound as they walked along. But then this woman comes up and drops in two very tiny coins that would not have made a sound at all. And that's when Jesus' ears perk up. And that's what we're gonna learn about is that Jesus actually saw so much more value in that than anything else that happened. Now, before we go on to the rest of the story, I just wanna make a point here. Think about this for a second. Who is this woman giving her money to? She's dropping it off at the temple. The temple was run by people that Jesus would later rebuke. He would tell people just out and out that they are blind guides, that they are hypocrites, that they, they're not good people. The temple, actually the money that they got from the temple offering went to fund, this is how it was prescribed in the law, it was, it was given for the livelihood of the priests. And the high priest that year, his name was Caiaphas. And you might remember what, so Caiaphas was on the payroll. This woman was funding Caius' salary And you might remember what Caiaphas did. He hatched a plan to betray Jesus. He went to Judas and he gave him 30 pieces of silver. And now I don't know where he got the 30 pieces of silver or where they got 30 pieces of silver, but there's a chance that they dipped it right out of the temple treasury. There's a chance that Caiaphas actually had to fill out an expense report to Judas to betray the son of man. Like that's 30 pieces of silver. This money, I guess what I'm saying is it's it's not going to good places It's going to somewhere that Jesus will say is corrupt and yet Jesus applauds her for doing this. Now, my point is, not that we should just give without thinking about where we're giving. I don't mean that at all. Somebody misunderstood me in the first service. I wanna be clear with that. You should definitely ask questions and try to figure out where money goes. My point in that 
is that God is impressed with the giver. That's his point. We focus on where the money goes and God's like, I'm after your heart. I would make this point. God doesn't need your money. You might be like, well, Grant, then what are we talking about? Why are we in a four-week series about money? Well, listen, God doesn't need your money. He owns everything that exists. Everything in the world is his and everything that we have has just been put in our possession. And God gives it to us because he needs the real estate in your heart currently occupied by money. That's what God's after. And the reason he's impressed with this woman is because she isn't giving to anybody but God. And he sees her heart. The next verse, it says, calling his disciples to him. Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. For those of you who are math people, you like spreadsheets, maybe you're into bookkeeping, whatever. That's really bad math. I think, I think honestly, some people probably stood back and said, no, she didn't. The guy that had a bucket of coins and stood back five feet and did this, he gave more than her. And Jesus said, no, but this is what I value. This is what's important. They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Jesus is recognizing that this woman isn't, she's not given to Caiaphas, she's not given to the temple. In this moment, she is coming with faith, with trust, out of an overflow of worship, out of an overflow of commitment to God. She is coming and she is giving her heart. It's kind of like uh, Valentine's Day. Some of you guys out here, you did really good on Valentine's Day with your girlfriend or your wife. You did a really good job. The other 99% of you kind of phoned it in, didn't you? This is just how some men are, <laughs> right? On Valentine's Day, you were, you were planning on phoning it in, some of you. Some of you are like, it's just a Hallmark holiday, it's just a made up thing. If you want to know how much I love you, just look at that refrigerator right there. Like that's how I take care of my baby. And so you're an idiot, but like, <laughs> but like, or, or there's some of you who are like, no, it's important to her. So like you, you, but you kind of do it last minute, right? You're like, oh no, you know, you're driving home from work on, on Valentine's day and you're like, oh no, the, it's the love of my life. I, oh yeah. So I got So you pop in somewhere. And here's the thing, you're gonna be last minute and, and CVS and Walgreens, they know this, right? And so if you go in there last minute, they've got a collection of junk that is marketed towards men. This is not for women. It's marketed towards men. Like you can go in and you can find this glass ball at Walgreens with a flower inside of it. Anybody see this? Don't raise your hand if you bought this for your lady, okay? This is not for women. This is marketed towards men. Because you walk in and you go, well, I could buy $70 worth of roses that'll die in a few days, or I can buy this that'll last forever for $14.99. All right, so you pick that up and you take it, and then you walk by and you get the Whitman's chocolate. Even people at Whitman's are not proud of their chocolate. This is not for women. But you grab that because it's, it's in a Valentine's Day box. It's all the packaging. You put that together, you go to the cash register, you give it to your spouse, you give it to your girlfriend, you hand it off, and you're like, here you go, baby, my love. And she's like, thanks. Good job, you. And here's the thing about it. You messed up and you don't even realize that you messed up, right? You missed this opportunity because here's the deal. She can't tell you what you're supposed to do because that would defeat the whole purpose. Some of you have spouses that tell you, they're just like, well, we got, you got me reservations and uh, here's what you bought me. But that probably shouldn't even work like that anyway. Like she can't tell you exactly what you're supposed to do because it is genuinely something that's supposed to come from your heart. And whatever you do is whatever you do. I think in the same way, that's what we would learn about giving an offering to God is it, it isn't about the dollar amount. It isn't always about where it's going. What it comes down to is this is your relationship with God and money and that, that real estate in your heart can't occupy both the space of you putting your trust and hope and belief and faith in money and in God. 
And so God simply, when we give back to him, it is genuinely, it is genuinely something that's supposed to come from our heart. And here's what God does in response to that. God promises. It doesn't matter what you give. I will always take care of you, no matter how much you give me in offering. In Malachi chapter three, it says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now, first of all, this is a principle that's really important, but sometimes this gets misused because this is something that God's saying to the nation of Israel. He's saying, listen, if you do what I've told you to do, like you can't outgive me. Like it's always going to be okay. Don't worry about it. But sometimes this verse gets misused. And you probably, if you've been in church a little while, you've heard somebody misuse it, especially if you've ever watched a televangelist because they'll get up and what they do is they propose this as an investment opportunity. Like if you, if you give to God, then you're gonna wear the clothes you want and drive the cars you want. You'll be flying around in airplanes if you just have enough faith and give and, and open, God will open up the storehouses. That's how you've probably heard this. And that's not what this verse means. There's not a big attachment here to the, the big if in your relationship with God. God is saying, if you give to me, I will give to you. I will take care of you. But here's the deal. I'm gonna give to you and I'm gonna take care of you no matter what. Jesus says that he takes care of the the lilies of the field. He takes care of the the sparrows, that his eye is on the sparrow. And and he says in the same way he takes care of them, he's gonna take care of you. And there's no attachment or there's, there's no conditional promise at the end of that passage. He doesn't turn and say, if you give enough. He doesn't say that. God's gonna... God's gonna always love you. He's always going to provide for you. He's always going to take care of you. But if you, if you worship him and honor him with your money, you don't have to worry about it because he will always, he will always be there. Now, the question I think we have to figure out is God will show you your first fruits. We just have to, we just have to listen. We just have to figure out what that really looks like. What is an offering to God look like? I want to do this little exercise with you. I want you to imagine that you're going you're gonna to cash out. You're going to take all the money out of your savings accounts, your 401k. You're going to put that all in $100 bills. You're going to liquidate your house and your cars. If you have a boat or a motorcycle, you're going to take that all the way down. And you're just going to put everything in a stack of $100 bills. And then you're going to go on a prayer retreat and you're going to go out into the desert somewhere. You're going to lay this all out before God. And you're gonna pray to God and you're like, okay, God, here's everything I have. My family's literally standing on a street homeless right now. Here's everything that I have. God, how much do you want? And God, I believe his response, if he were to answer back, would be, well, how much do you wanna give? I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know. Like, what will it take, you know? Like, how much will it take? And I think God's response would be like, how much would it take to what? How much would it take to what? Well, you know, I just wanna make sure that like I'm giving enough to like, you're always gonna like take care of me and stuff. And God's like, I'll always take care of you. I love you, I died for you. This is all stuff that I've given you. My question to you is how, how much do you want to give? And some of us would go, is... 10%? Does that sound good? God would be like, does that sound good to you? And we're like, yeah. And then maybe some of us would be like, God, do you, do you want me to give it all? Because the widow gave it all. Do you want me to give this all? And God would be like, do you want to give it all? And we'd be like, no. I don't really want to give it all. And God would be like, well, then don't give it all. I think he would say, this is all that's been given to you. Everything is from me. What do you want to give? I think one of the best passages in 2 Corinthians is 2 Corinthians chapter nine. It says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves 
a cheerful giver. An elder at the first church I was at, and he would always do this offering meditation. He'd, he'd read this verse, and he'd be like, so everybody smile. But the point is that God wants to do this out of a, a response, a response to what he's done in our life, a response to, to the, the fact that we have cried out to him, that we put our faith in him, that we've sought after him. He wants us to do it as a response. When, when Jesus initiated a relationship with us, he did it by giving his his all, his everything. He sent his only son to die for us. That's how he initiated and restored a relationship with us. And so he is just simply saying, what do you want to do in response to that? I've talked to many people over the years and it looks different for a lot of people. I knew one guy, he said, for me, a first fruit for me, my heart is, it's gotta be the biggest payment I make every month. More than my house, more than my car, more than anything else I've got going on. As long, and sometimes that means I need to make my other payments smaller and sometimes that means I need to make my offering bigger. I know for some people, it's just like 10%. It's a commitment. It's a, and for many of you, that would be a huge commitment. You would be like, wow, that is a big decision. I wanna give, I wanna give 10%. percent I had a buddy growing up and or we were coming up in ministry together. And uh, I knew what he made. We were both young pastors, especially when you're young and a pastor, that's a, that's a, that's a poor place to be. So I knew what we uh, both were making and I knew that he made slightly more than I did. And he was just sharing one day that he, he really was talking to his wife about how he gets to 20% because he thinks it's really important. He wants to give 20%. I don't know where that number came from. That was just something he wanted to do. And I was sitting there going, 20, 20. I know what we meant, 20, w- whatever that is. God is saying to you today, like, whatever, whatever that looks like. For the widow, it was, was everything. So somewhere between zero and everything is what God is calling us to do today. Let me pray for you. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't have this attachment or this fixation with money as we as we look to you, as we trust in you, as we are open-handed in our relationship with you, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to be free from believing that it's our hard work, it's, it's our determination, but that it is genuinely you who provides for us and takes care of us. God, as we believe that and as we trust in that, I pray that you would free us from, from our God being our finances. God, we are so thankful for everything that you've provided for us that as we evaluate what you've given to us, Lord, I just pray that we would be free in our return to you. And I pray that in Christ's name, amen. We're gonna move into